As we saw in the last lecture, Nyquist stability is a powerful tool to assess the stability of a closed-loop system based on its open-loop frequency response. Most of the analysis relies on having the Nyquist plot of a given function. We covered the principles of the Nyquist stability criterion in the previous lecture, and in this lecture we're going to see how we can draw the Nyquist plot from the transfer function or from the frequency response of a system as specified in a Bode plot. By the end of this lecture, you should be able to draw the approximate Nyquist plot of a transfer function, relate the Nyquist plot to frequency response, that is the Bode plot, and determine the stability based on the open loop transfer function. Before we go into these details, let's do a quick review of the Nyquist stability criterion. The Nyquist stability criterion uses the frequency response of a linear system to determine its stability. The advantage of this method is that we can look at the open loop transfer function and infer stability of the closed loop system. As we know, the frequency response of any system can be determined experimentally by giving this linear system a sinusoidal input with a magnitude a and frequency omega, and provided that the process or the system g of s is linear, then the output is also a sinusoidal waveform with the same frequency but with now a phase shift, and the magnitude of the output is b. What does this information about the open loop system tell us about the stability of the closed loop system? This is a very important question because it clearly shows the interest of Nyquist's stability criteria. We can look at this relation between the input and the output of a system, calculate, for example, the gain of the transfer function g of s, which is equivalent to b over a, calculate the phase of g of s, that is phi, and based on this open loop information about g of s, the Nyquist stability criterion will infer the stability of a closed loop system with a unit negative feedback loop like this one when g of s is used in that of a control system. There are clearly two advantages here. The first one is that we can obtain the open loop response of this process experimentally. And the second is that we can use the open loop characteristics of g of s to infer its stability in a closed loop system. Now let's do a quick review of the Nyquist stability criterion. A open loop transfer function c times g, where c is the controller and g the process, is said to be open loop stable if all the poles of c times g have negative real parts. If this system is now used in a unit feedback loop such as this one, then the closed loop transfer function y over x, which in this case is called t of s, is the line function c times g divided by 1 plus the line function c times g. The system is said to be closed loop stable provided that the poles of t of s have negative real parts located on the left side of the s plane. A equivalent statement is that this system is closed loop stable provided that the zeros of its characteristic equation have negative real parts. To develop the Nyquist stability criterion, we use Cauchy's argument principle. Cauchy's argument principle says that if you place all poles and all zeros of a transfer function on the s plane, such as in this graph, the phase and magnitude of the transfer function when point P is the point of excitation can be obtained by drawing all these lines that connect the poles and zeros to that point, find the magnitude of each of these vectors and the angle they form with the real axis, and the magnitude is simply given by the multiplication of the magnitude of all zeros divided by the multiplication of the magnitude of all poles. The phase of the transfer function is given by the sum of the angle of all zeros, in this case phi1 and phi2, minus the sum of the angle of all poles, in this case phi3 and phi4, as shown here. We can now represent the phase and magnitude in this new domain that we call the W domain. This vector now connects this reference point to the origin of the W domain. The magnitude of the transfer function is this distance, and the phase of the transfer function is given by that angle. If you now move from having one point on the S plane to a contour, we should also see a contour on the W plane. Here, instead of having a single point, which is the input to the transfer function, we are going to take this point and make this point do a loop around a random contour. By forming this contour on the S plane, we shall see a contour on the W plane as well. Let's start with the contour gamma 3. Place a point along gamma 3, we can connect all poles and zeros to that point, and now make that point move along the defined contour, and update all the lines. As we discussed in the previous lecture, we see that because this contour doesn't have any zeros or any poles inside, the angle of all these lines that connect the poles and zeros to the reference point will simply oscillate, that is, we will start at a given point, go up and down, and back to the same point. 
This means that the net angle change of the transfer function as the reference point S traverses gamma 3 is zero. If this is the case, then the contour displayed in the W plane must have the same behavior. By placing a point along this contour, we shall see the same behavior occurring. The reference angle of these lines will simply oscillate and go back to where it started. So the net angle change is also zero. From this analysis, we can say that this contour can be placed anywhere on the W plane, but it can never encircle the origin. If the contour gamma 3 is in a clockwise direction, the equivalent contour on the W plane will also be in the clockwise direction. Now let's look at the contour gamma 1. Once again, the same reference point is defined along the contour and you can now calculate all the magnitudes and all the angles between poles and zeros with respect to that point. And here it is easy to see that the same behavior will occur for all these poles and zeros. As the point moves around the contour, all these angles will simply oscillate and will come back to where they started. However, we notice that now we have a zero inside of this contour. And as the point loops around the contour, we see a net angle change of positive 360 degrees. Where is the positive sign coming from? Remember again that the phase is the sum of the angle of all zeros minus the sum of angle of all poles. This will be zero because the poles are all outside of the contour. And here we have plus 360 degrees. The question now is, how do we get a similar contour on the W plane? The answer is very simple. On the W plane, the contour will have to encircle the origin once. If you take a reference point here and move the reference point around the contour, we'll see that at this angle here, will do a full 360 degree revolution. And you'll do so in the clockwise direction, hence the positive sign. So this is the contour for gamma 1. We can now look at gamma 2. We can place the reference point along the contour, trace all these lines, and you should now see the same behavior. For all poles and zeros that are outside of that contour, the net angle change is zero. However, this contour has a pole inside, and this pole will now experience a full 360 degree phase change. Because it is a pole, this will result in negative 360 degrees. On the W plane, we should see an encirclement of the origin. This is for gamma 2, because in the same way, now we can rotate around the origin to achieve the same angle. This is negative 360 degrees, so this contour will now encircle the origin in the counterclockwise direction. We can now explore this idea to assess the stability of a system whose characteristic equation is 1 plus c times g. If this function is known to have a number p of poles in the right half plane, that is, a number p of unstable poles, and a number z of zeros in the right half plane, for a contour that encircles the entire unstable region, the relation between p and the net number of clockwise encirclements of the origin is n equals to z minus p. In short, to assess the stability of a system, we will need to look for poles or zeros on this region of the S-plane, poles of the closed-loop transfer function, or zeros of the characteristic equation. It is then convenient to define the contour that encircles the entire unstable region. Take points along this contour one by one, input these points into the transfer function or the characteristic equation, evaluate the phase and magnitude, and plot the corresponding point on the W plane. If we know that there are poles and zeros inside of this contour, then the net number of encirclements of the origin is simply the number of zeros minus the number of poles inside of that contour. This is covered in greater detail in lecture 18. It is important to notice now that if we are dealing with a characteristic equation, we are looking for zeros inside of this contour. Any zero inside of this contour will make the closed loop system unstable. Remember that the poles inside of this contour do not make the system unstable, because these poles are the same as the poles of the open loop transfer function. But what makes the system unstable are the zeros of the characteristic equation. So even if the number of encirclements is zero, this does not guarantee stability, because the system could have one pole and one zero, or two poles and two zeros, and the result of this is always zero. And yet, the system has, in this case, two unstable zeros. We can now take this approach one step further, and instead of looking at the characteristic equation of the closed-loop system, we can find a maneuver to look at the open-loop transfer function. This is very simple. The relation between them is simply this added one here. 
which comes from eliminating the feedback loop. If you subtract one from this function, we go to the open loop transfer function. And you can now use the open loop transfer function to assess the stability of the closed loop system. In equation one, the original equation, if there is a pole R0 in the unstable region, the contour of one encircles the origin. However, when you subtract one from equation one, then the entire Nyquist plot now shifts to the left by one unit. And now instead of encircling zero, the Nyquist plot will encircle negative one. Now, if the open loop transfer function C times G has a zero or pole in the unstable region, its contour will encircle negative one as opposed to zero. The advantage is now that we can look at the open loop transfer function and do not have to calculate the new poles and zeros that would result from equation one. We can now summarize the Nyquist stability criterion as follows. The open loop transfer function L has Z unstable closed loop roots given by Z equals to N plus P, where N is the number of clockwise encirclements of negative one, where counterclockwise encirclements are negative, and P is the number of unstable poles of the open loop transfer function. Remember that the poles of the open loop transfer function are the same as the poles of the characteristic equation of the closed loop system. Thus, P is known by looking at the open loop transfer function. For stability, this must be zero. Hence, we can say that a open loop transfer function, L of S, is closed loop stable if and only if the number of counterclockwise encirclements of negative one is equal to the number of poles of L of S with positive real parts, or the number of unstable poles of L of S. We must see counterclockwise encirclements for every unstable pole of the open loop transfer function. Every counterclockwise encirclement counts as N equals to negative one, and every unstable pole of the open loop transfer function counts as plus one, so they will eventually cancel out. Thus, this condition must be respected for closed loop stability. This is where we stopped in the last lecture, and at this point we should be able to have a solid understanding of the entire derivation of the Nyquist stability criterion, and of course we should be able to apply this criterion to any given transfer function. Now let's take this one step further and look at how to draw the Nyquist plot. If you're using MATLAB, simply type Nyquist H, where H is a transfer function, and it should plot the Nyquist plot. But let's see how this is done by hand. How do we create the Nyquist plot for a given function? Let's consider this function, for, for example, L of S equals to S plus one over S squared plus three. We have all the information we need. We have the transfer function, and we also have a specified contour in the S plane. At a first attempt, we could simply take random points along this contour, for example, when you are along the imaginary axis 1j, so the excitation frequency is 1 radians per second, 2j, 3j, and so on, take each point, replace s with the value of that point, evaluate the phase and magnitude of L of s, and then plot the corresponding vector on the w plane. This will work, it will definitely provide a contour. However, this is a very tedious process because it would require many points to have a meaningful Nyquist contour plot. There's gotta be a better way, and it is. If you look closely, the Nyquist contour can be divided into two segments. The first segment, is the imaginary axis. Along this segment, S equals to J omega, and it goes from zero to infinity. Does this ring a bell? Well, it should, because this is exactly the Bode plot. This is the input to a Bode plot. The entire Bode plot is located on that axis. The second segment is the contour at infinity. All the contour that it goes around from infinity to negative infinity. This is segment number two. It turns out that this entire segment at infinity maps to a single point on the Nyquist plot. If you're now able to find the corresponding segment one and segment two on the Nyquist plot, then our job is pretty much done. There is another way to simplify this by knowing that the Nyquist plot is always symmetric with respect to the real axis, which means that only half of this contour needs to be evaluated. And then once you get the corresponding contour on the W plane, we can simply mirror that a contour around the real axis. Now let's see how segments one and two can be mapped onto the W plane. In this analysis, you're going to use only properly defined transfer function. In a properly defined transfer function, the degree of the numerator is never greater than the denominator, which is always the case for physical systems. Let's start this analysis with segment two. 
And let's consider the case where we have more poles than zeros in the transfer function. The idea is the same we have used up to this point. We have a reference point. This reference point now moves along this contour at infinity. We define the phase and magnitude of all poles and zeros. Here is the angle of one pole. Here is the angle of one zero and so on. And we know that the distance between the point and the pole is the magnitude of that pole. And the same is valid for the zeros. We can now calculate the magnitude of the transfer function, the entire transfer function, by multiplying the magnitude of all zeros and dividing that by the magnitude of all poles. If we have more poles than zeros, when s tends to infinity, then the magnitude of all poles and zeros will also tend to infinity. However, having more poles than zeros will ensure that this division goes to zero. The magnitude of the entire transfer function tends to zero. The phase in this case is not defined and is also irrelevant. The phase of something whose magnitude is zero is irrelevant. Thus, from this analysis, we can conclude that the entire contour at infinity, it will map to a single point on the Nyquist plot. And this point is zero. The entire contour at infinity maps to zero. This is again only valid for transfer functions with more poles than zeros. Now let's consider segment two but a case number two, where the transfer function has the same number of poles and zeros. We can apply the same principle as before. We can use the same expression to find the magnitude, the multiplication of all zeros, divided by the multiplication of the magnitude of all poles. We know that at infinity, these distances are all tending to infinity. But now we have the same number of poles and zeros. We have infinite divided by infinite, which in this case, the result of this division is a constant. Now we can calculate the phase of the transfer function. And to do that, we can define these angles phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, and phi 4. When this point tends to infinity, we can see that a phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, and phi 4 will tend to the same value. Thus, the phase of the transfer function tends to zero. The sum of the angle of all zeros minus the sum of angle of all poles is zero when all these angles are equal. Thus, the entire contour at infinity will map to a point having magnitude beta and a phase of zero. This means that a beta is a real number and lies on the positive real axis. We can see this if we plot point beta on the real and imaginary axis on the W plane. Here is beta having a phase of zero. So beta is a positive real number. And this is all we need to know about segment two. Segment two will always map to a single point it will be zero if the transfer function has more poles than zeros, or it will be any other point on the positive real axis in case this transfer function has the same number of poles and zeros. Now we can move on to segment one, which is the entire positive imaginary axis. Remember that this again represents the frequency response of a system. By picking a point along this positive imaginary axis, we are specifying the frequency of excitation of the system, which is the same as plotting the Bode plot for that a given system. To map the imaginary axis onto the W plane, there are many approaches. But from experience, it is sufficient to use four points. The first point is the starting point at zero. The second point is when now we are on the imaginary axis, but the frequency tends to infinity. The third point is the point on the W plane where the plot crosses the real axis. For this random Nyquist plot, it would be this point or that point. And the fourth point is the point on the W plane where the Nyquist plot crosses the imaginary axis, this point or that point. And having these four points is sufficient to draw the Nyquist plot. This concept will be better explained with an example. So let's go to the light board and solve one example there. In this series of exercises, you are going to draw the Nyquist plot for certain functions and evaluate the stability of the closed loop system. Let's start with function L of s equals to one over s squared plus s plus one. The first step here is now to split this function into a real and imaginary part. To do that, we can now replace s with j omega and expand this equation. L of j omega now becomes one over j omega squared plus j omega plus one, which is one over one minus omega squared plus j omega. j squared is negative one. 
Now we can multiply this by the conjugate of this complex number. So 1 minus omega squared minus j omega. And here also divided by the same 1 minus omega squared times negative j omega. Now we can expand this, create two functions, one of the real numerator, the other one with the imaginary part of the numerator. This is 1 minus omega squared divided by 1 minus omega squared squared minus j omega squared plus j times negative omega divided by the same 1 minus omega squared minus j omega squared. We can also solve for this. This gives 1 minus omega squared divided by, we don't need to expand that, 1 minus omega squared squared plus omega squared. Uh, j squared is negative 1 times 1 is plus 1 times omega squared plus j times negative omega divided by the same. And here we have the real part clearly shown there. And this is the imaginary part of the function. And this is now what we need to determine the four key points in a Nyquist plot. That is the magnitude and phase when the frequency tends to zero, to infinity, and the real and imaginary axis crossing. So I'm going to write this expression here, and you're going to use this now to find these points on the Nyquist plot. To evaluate the phase and the magnitude of the transfer function, we can place the poles of and zeros of this transfer function on the S plane. This transfer function has two poles and no zeros, and you can see that these poles are complex conjugate numbers. The damping ratio is less than 1, so they will be placed on the left side of the S-plane. They have the same real part, and they have conjugate imaginary parts. As if this is AJ, this would be negative AJ. Now we can put in our point of interest. The point of interest that we want to evaluate now is when omega tends to 0. This is the first point on the Nyquist plot. When omega tends to zero, and we are looking again only on the imaginary axis, we are only sweeping now the, the frequency axis. So omega equals to zero, sigma in frequency domain is always zero, which means that the point we want is here, omega equals to zero. We can now take this point as the reference point and find the angle of all poles and zeros with respect to that point. So here they are. This is one of them. This is another one of them. The angle here is theta 1, the angle here would be theta 2. Clearly, because these poles are complex conjugate numbers, we can immediately say that a theta 1 equals to negative theta 2. They are the same values, but they simply have a different sign. We can now calculate the phase of the entire transfer function when omega tends to zero as the sum of angle of all zeros, in this case there is no zero, so that's zero, minus the sum of angles of all poles, which is theta one plus theta two. Because we know that a theta one equals to negative theta two, this is zero, so the angle of the transfer function is zero. We can now go here to our uh, expression and replace simply omega equals to zero. When omega equals to zero here, what do we get? We get L of zero equals to L of zero gives one over one plus zero. So the magnitude of L at zero when frequency is zero is simply one. So this is the first point of interest for the Nyquist plot. Let's write it here. When omega tends to zero, we have a phase of zero and a magnitude of one. Now we can do the same analysis when the frequency tends to infinity. So I'm going to erase this and you can repeat the analysis now when the frequency moves towards infinity. 
Now let's repeat the analysis for a point of interest which, which corresponds to omega tending to infinity. In this case, our point, our reference point is here and is tending to infinity. Here we have the two poles, same thing we had before. The only difference is that the point now moved from zero towards infinity. We can now again find the lines that will give us the angles between the poles and the point of interest. Here we have one of them, let's call this theta one. And then here we have another one of them, let's call this one theta two. Now we know that the frequency tends to infinity. As this point tends to infinity, what are the angles theta one and theta two? Well, clearly they will tend to 90 degrees each. Theta one tends to 90 degrees and theta two also tends to 90 degrees. Now the phase of the transfer function when the frequency tends to infinity is again the sum of angles of all zeros, which in this case is zero, minus the sum of angles of all poles, 90 degrees for theta two and 90 degrees for theta one. So the phase of our transfer function tends to 180 degrees. Now we can look at the magnitude. What happens to the magnitude when the frequency tends to infinity. We can evaluate L at infinity, and what do we get? We see that the real part will tend to zero because we have omega squared on top, but we have omega squared to the power of two. So this is omega to the power of four. The denominator increases faster than the numerator, the real part goes to zero. Same applies to the imaginary part. You see that we have omega on the numerator and omega to the power of four in the denominator. So this term also tends to zero. When omega tends to infinity, the magnitude of the transfer function tends to zero. And the phase tends to negative 180 degrees. I forgot the negative sign here, right? Negative, the sum minus the sum of all poles, 90 plus 90, negative sign, negative 180 degrees. So this is now the second point of interest. This is when omega tends to infinity. And for this case, we found that omega, that the phase is negative 180 degrees and the magnitude of the function L is zero. We now have two additional points to calculate, the imaginary and the real axis crossing. How do we do that? Well, if you want to find the point where the Nyquist plot crosses the real axis, we simply set the imaginary part to zero. And if you want to find the point where we cross the imaginary axis, then set the real part to zero. So let's do that. To find the real axis crossing, we can now set the imaginary part to zero. The imaginary part is given here. Notice that the imaginary part doesn't include J. J indicates the imaginary part. So now you have negative omega over one minus omega squared squared minus plus omega squared equals to zero. What are values of omega will make this tend to zero? Two values. If omega is zero, the numerator is zero, the entire function goes to zero. And if your omega tends to infinity, the denominator is very large, will also make the entire function tend to zero. So the real axis crossing will occur when omega tends to zero and when omega tends to infinity, which is the same we calculated here, omega equals to zero and omega equals to tending to infinity. Where exactly does the Nyquist plot cross the real axis? We can now simply evaluate the function at omega equals to zero and omega equals to infinity. We already did it, it's here. We'll cross the real axis at one, at an angle of zero degrees, of course, and at zero when the angle is negative 180 degrees. Right. So this analysis gave us exactly what we just found here. So here there is no additional information. Now let's do the imaginary axis crossing. Now in this case, we'll set the real part to zero. And what do we get? If you set the real part to zero, now you have one minus omega squared over one minus omega squared squared plus omega squared equals to zero. What values will satisfy this equality? We have two. If omega equals to one, the numerator is zero, 
to solve for that, simply set 1 minus omega squared equals to 0, omega equals to 1, make this 0, which makes the entire function 0. Or, if omega tends to infinity, this will make the denominator very large, much larger than the numerator, and the entire fraction goes to 0. Omega tending to infinity was found here, phase negative 180 degrees, and the magnitude of 0. So these are the points where we'll cross the imaginary axis when omega tends to infinity. It will simply tend to zero. What about omega equals to one? Now, if you want to find the exact point where the Nyquist plot crosses the imaginary axis, we need to evaluate the transfer function at one radians per second. If you do this, we have in the first part zero, this is exactly what is solved for here. When omega equals to 1 radians per second, the real part goes to 0. 1 minus 1 is 0. This entire term goes to 0. Plus, here now when omega is 1, we'll find j times negative 1 divided by 0 plus 1, which is simply negative 1. So the magnitude of the transfer function is 1. And the actual value of the transfer function will be plus minus j. This is the point where the Nyquist plot intersects the imaginary axis. So this is now the new point for our analysis. It will cross the imaginary axis at plus minus j. And the real axis crossing occurs at zero and infinity, which is exactly what we found here. So no additional points are provided through this analysis for drawing the Nyquist plot. We are crossing the real axis exactly where the frequency tends to infinity are to zero. Now that we have all this information, we can finally draw the Nyquist plot. Here we have all points of interest that will help us draw the Nyquist plot. The first one is when the frequency tends to zero. This is our starting point. We have a midpoint where the Nyquist plot crosses the imaginary axis. We have also the information about the crossing of the real axis, which will fall into these two here, so no additional points. And you have the final point where the frequency tends to infinity. So let's just start with our starting point, the frequency tending to zero. When the frequency tends to zero, we have a magnitude of one and an angle of zero. So we are placed at 1 at an angle of 0. Remember that the angle is the angle of that line that will connect this point to the center of the, this plane. And in this case, the angle is 0. So we rely on the real axis, on the positive side of the real axis. And the magnitude is 1. So this distance is 1. This is our, this is our first point. Point 1. The midpoint we found here the imaginary axis crossing, negative j and plus j. So we are at around here and there. So this is our second point. The third point is the point where the frequency tends to infinity. In that point, when the frequency tends to infinity, now the phase is negative 180 degrees. So we are now lying Again, on the real axis, but we are on the other side of the imaginary axis. We are now to the left of the imaginary axis. All right, so if this angle here is zero, we go to one. But now, if you go all the way, that is 180 degrees or negative 180 degrees, this indicates that in point two, we are on the negative side of the real axis. The magnitude tends to zero. So we are lying around here. But I notice that we now tend to zero following a negative 180 degree line. So this Nyquist plot, we have to go to zero tangent to a line that has a negative 180 degree angle. Now we have all the elements here. This is the second point. This, in fact, is the third point to avoid confusion there. And now we can connect them. We can start from 1. We go to negative j, which is the 
imaginary axis crossing. And now we have to tend to zero following a negative 180 degree line. So the only solution is that the Nyquist plot will do this. Notice how it tends to zero and it does so following a negative 180 degree angle. This is half of the Nyquist plot, but we know that the Nyquist plot is always symmetric with respect to the real axis, which means that the complete Nyquist plot should look like this. We know that the Nyquist plot goes clockwise. We went from this point to that point, so this will also go clockwise like that. Now we can evaluate the stability of our system. We are concerned with encirclements of negative 1. Now that we have the Nyquist plot, we can finally evaluate the stability of the closed loop system. We are now concerned with encirclements of negative 1. What can we conclude about the stability of this system? Clearly, this system is always stable. It does not encircle negative 1. Even if you multiply this function by a very large gain, all that does is it will expand the size of the Nyquist plot. But because now the Nyquist plot tends to zero following this 180 degree, I will never encircle negative one. So this system is always stable. There is one more special case that we need to address to be able to draw all Nyquist plots. This will occur when you have a zero or a pole on the imaginary axis. A polar zero on the imaginary axis will create an arc at infinity. Let's take this example. The transfer function is defined as h of s equals to 1 over s. So this transfer function has only one pole and this pole is at zero. Let's assume that a point p is traveling along the contour and will eventually approach that point at zero. The magnitude of the transfer function is given as 1 over the distance of that point p to the pole. As p approaches the pole, this distance will tend to zero, which means that the magnitude of the transfer function will tend to infinity. We can also notice that as p approaches the pole, the angle of the transfer function is the sum of angle of all zeros, which is zero, minus the sum of angle of all poles, which in this case is negative 90 degrees. So the angle of the transfer function is positive 90 degrees. As p approaches zero, the magnitude tends to infinity and the phase tends to plus 90 degrees. But the phase becomes undefined when p is exactly at zero. So this creates an indetermination and you need to find a way around it. And the solution is indeed to just go around the pole. Instead of defining the contour around the entire unstable region, we are going to redefine the contour in a way that we can avoid that a singular point around the pole. So up to these two points, the contour is the same, but now we define the contour around the pole. The distance is very small, but it's not zero. This will remove that indetermination and we will allow the phase to be calculated near that pole. The magnitude of the transfer function will continue to be at infinity around this point, but now we can determine the phase. Let's define here three points. Let's call this point number one, this point number two, and this point here number three. The magnitude of the transfer function at one, two, or three is infinity because the distance between points one, two, and three to zero are very small. Because the distance from point one, two, or three to zero is very small. What is the phase? The phase for point one, which is on the negative imaginary axis, is clearly negative 90 degrees. But because you have a pole, the sum of angle of all zeros, that is zero, minus the sum of angle of all poles, negative 90 degrees, plus 90 degrees. At point two, it is easy to see that the phase is zero. And at point three, now we are on the positive real axis. Phase here is 90 degrees, but because this is a pole, then we have zero minus 90 degrees, negative 90 degrees. So as we loop around this contour around the pole, the magnitude is, is still infinity. But now we know that the phase goes from plus 90 degrees at point one to zero degrees at point two, to negative 90 degrees at point three. Now let's complete this example. I'm going to take these three random points on the S plane. The first point I'm going to call here point one. This will be point two and this will be point three. Point three is at infinity and points one and two are very close to zero. Now let's look at a point one. At point one, clearly the magnitude of the transfer function 
is infinity because again we have one over that a distance between the point and zero and this distance tends to zero so the magnitude of the transfer function tends to infinity the phase at point one is this line here this angle and this angle and this angle is zero hence the phase is zero at point two the magnitude of the transfer function is, is still infinity what is the phase of the transfer function the phase at point two is negative 90 degrees recall that the point is on the positive real axis so the phase is positive 90 degrees but we are dealing with a pole this is the phase of a pole recall that the point is placed on the positive real axis here is the pole here is the point of interest and this is the connection between them this angle is 90 degrees but because we are dealing with a pole we have sum of angles of all zeros minus sum of angle of all poles no zero so the sum of angle of all zeros is zero minus positive 90 degrees equals to negative 90 degrees at point three what is the phase of the transfer function we are still on the positive imaginary axis the phase continues to be negative 90 degrees what is the magnitude of the transfer function well now point three tends to infinity so the magnitude of the transfer function tends to zero once again, to visualize that, we can plot the S-plane. Here is the pole. Here is the point of interest. This is the distance. Let's call that distance P. The magnitude of the transfer function is simply 1 over P. This point is tending to infinity, so P also tends to infinity. This whole thing tends to 0. With these three points, we can now start to draw the Nyquist plot. The first point has a magnitude at infinity and a phase of zero from the phase we can conclude that at this point must be on the positive real axis this is point one and that a distance to the origin is infinity point two has a magnitude of infinity as well but a phase of negative 90 degrees we can thus conclude that at this point must be placed on the negative imaginary axis is point two point three has a phase of negative 90 degrees so it's again on the negative imaginary axis but a magnitude of zero so this point is tending to the origin right there and this is point three we can now connect this three point to form half of the nyquist plot and we went from one to two to three this is the line we followed here so the nyquist plot will now go in that same direction and because we know that the nyquist plot is symmetric with respect to the real axis we can mirror this plot around the real axis and this is the nyquist contour of one over s Remember that at this distance is tending to infinity. What can we conclude about the stability of 1 over s when put in a unit feedback loop? Well, we can say that the system is always stable because the Nyquist plot never encircles negative 1 and the transfer function h of s has no unstable open loop poles. This would be the unit feedback loop and the closed loop transfer function is simply 1 over s plus 1 which is stable. The last two we need to understand the Nyquist stability criterion and its relation to a Bode plot is to be able to infer the Nyquist plot based on the Bode plot. As we saw before, when you sweep the first segment by selecting a point of interest here, this point specifies the input frequency to a system. And as this point moves across segment 1, we are exploring the entire imaginary axis. This means that the frequency will go from 0 to infinity. This is exactly what we see in the Bode plot. So the entire Bode plot is mapped onto segment 1. Now we're going to try to infer the Nyquist plot based on the Bode plot because essentially they display the same information. The only difference is that the Nyquist plot doesn't have the frequency information. To do this, we are going to use a anal to do this, we're going to use the same reference points that we use for Nyquist. First, we need to locate those points on the Bode plot. One of the points of interest in the Nyquist plot is when the frequency tends to zero. Where is that on the Bode plot? On the Bode plot, this is the lowest frequency we have, which in this case is 10 to the power of negative 3. We can select our first point of interest as being the point with the lowest frequency. Let's call this point P1. At point P1, the phase is zero and the magnitude is 40 decibels. So the magnitude of P1 is... 40 dB. 20 log of P1 was 40 decibels. P1, magnitude of P1, must be 100. Where is that point on the Nyquist plot? We have a phase of 0 and a magnitude of 100. So clearly, this is this point on the Nyquist plot. 
phase is zero, we are on the positive real axis, and the magnitude is 100. Another point of interest in the Nyquist plot was the intersection with the negative real axis, that is when the phase is negative 90 degrees. We can see this on the Bode plot by starting at a phase of negative 90 degrees, marking our point P2. We can now go up and select at the same point for the magnitude. This is P2 as well. What can we notice here? We can say that P2 has a magnitude greater than 0 decibels, which means that the magnitude of P2 will be greater than 1 in non-decibel scale, and has a phase of negative 90 degrees. So clearly, this would be located at a phase of negative 90 degrees on the Nyquist plot, that is, this is the point where the Nyquist plot intersects the negative real axis. And here we have point P2. What is this distance? This distance is obtained as the magnitude that we see on the Bode plot. In this case, let's assume, for example, that this would be 30 decibels. Know that the magnitude of P2 is approximately 30 dB, and this was obtained by calculating 20 log of the magnitude of P2, and this is 30. Now solving for P2, this is this distance. The next point of interest is when the phase now tends to negative 180 degrees. This is the point where we cross the real axis again, but now on the other side of the imaginary axis. If you select a phase of negative 180 degrees, we can see here that the phase actually never goes to negative 180 degrees. The phase, when the frequency tends to infinity, tends to negative 180 degrees, but it's never 180 degrees. We can now go up and see what the magnitude is. Well, the magnitude, as the frequency tends to infinity, is tending to negative infinity decibels. What it gives 20 log of a magnitude as something that attends to negative infinity? P3, the magnitude of P3, must be therefore tending to zero. If this is the point P3, we can say that a P3 has a phase that tends to negative 180 degrees and a magnitude that tends to negative infinity decibels, which is the same as same tending to zero in a non-decibel scale. Where is that point? Well, magnitude of zero, we must be here. This is P3. But we need to approach zero following this angle of negative 180 degrees. And here it is. We can see that we will approach zero following the negative 180 degree asymptote. From this analysis, we can see that if the open loop system is stable, that is P equals to zero, no unstable poles, the closed loop system is also stable because n is zero. The Nyquist plot never encircles negative one. Now let's summarize the step for analysis to obtain the Nyquist plot. First, in the transfer function, set s equals to j omega. Then evaluate the points where omega is equals to zero and where omega tends to infinity, including phase and magnitude. Third, find the points where the plot crosses the imaginary and the real axis. Then sketch half of the Nyquist plot and mirror the Nyquist plot about the real axis. Evaluate the number of clockwise encirclements of a negative 1. If encirclements are in a counterclockwise direction, then n is negative. From the open loop transfer function, determine the number p of unstable poles. Finally, based on the Nyquist plot and the number of unstable poles and encirclements of a negative 1, calculate the number z of unstable roots and assess the stability of the closed loop system. It is now time to do some more exercises on the light board. I recommend you practice them on your own. You can always use the command Nyquist in MATLAB to display the Nyquist plot of any function. Thank you.